uh, it's it's really an honor for me to be here and talk to you. I remember when I was getting my master's in Malaysia in e-learning technologies, I uh, read your work and I kind of was thinking, is it possible to someday see Dr. Keller and sit <laughs> with him in, in class or something? Now, I'm in your office, in your home in Tallahassee, Florida, and uh, I have the honor to talk to you about some questions. And this interview has been uh, asked by one of the universities in Iran called University of Farhangia. So if you want to start by saying something. Okay, Ahmad, thank you for this opportunity. I, uh, I, I've never been to Iran, although I would love to visit that beautiful country. You know, I still remember reading about Persia and, and the uh, history of Iran. So let's start from our field. One of the purposes of this interview is to let people who do not know instructional design uh, and learning systems and generally our field know more about it. So the first question is that, how do you define our field, simple and? Okay, well, briefly, I define it as uh, the art and science of making learning systems and learning experiences as effective, efficient, engaging, and intrinsically appealing as possible. Now that's, a that's a mouthful of abstract words, but I'll, I'll, I think a little history would be helpful. When I first, uh, I was teaching English in high school, taking courses in philosophy and social science, and I wanted to make a change in my life. And so I, uh, I looked into various graduate programs, and I had been studying psychology. I had almost an equivalent of a, I had degrees in philosophy and almost in psychology. But then a, a colleague of mine told me about this field of uh, educational technology. And so I looked into it, and it seemed to tie together all of my interests because I had been active in, uh, in uh, filmmaking and, and, as I said, in, in pedagogy and all of these different things. And I love doing things hands-on, you know. So uh, I, I looked into graduate programs, and there was one in, in uh, Los Angeles and Indiana, Syracuse, Michigan. But the one I chose was in Indiana, Indiana University, Instructional Systems Design, they called it, and, uh, or Instructional Systems and Technology. And I really liked that because it blended you know, uh, a, a holistic view of a systems perspective with specific uh, components of technology applications. And so it, it seemed to blend all my various interests. Plus they had a strong psychology department, which I thought was good, and also an industrial psychology department. Mm -hmm. So I applied and I was fortunate enough to get a fellowship, so I went. and. Uh, had a wonderful experience there. When I graduated from Indiana University, I went to Syracuse University, and they also had a program that was becoming more of an instructional systems program. Some of the programs were focusing on educational technology, but to me, some of them it was almost like advanced audiovisual, you know, and I wanted the human element more than just the technology. So anyway, so, so my definition of the field which I think is, is pretty consistent, is about the, uh, the uh, art and science of making learning systems and experiences as effective and efficient as possible. But after I went to work at Syracuse and then developed my own focus in motivation, you know, I expanded that to uh, include the ideas of engaging motivation, in other words, intrinsic appeal. And I know Charlie Rigeluth, uh, whom you know, many of you are familiar with, of course, he added the word appealing to his definition of the field. So to make learning environments that are effective, efficient, and appealing is a, a definition I'm very comfortable with. It brings me to the next question that uh, some people have different understanding of mm -hmm. our field. And when you say education technology and the word technology is really associated with devices, computers, and hardware, yes, rather than techniques and um, uh, all of those processes that we go through to design a really appealing and motivational right. um, instruction. So, what do you talk? How can you respond to this misconception that technology, education technology, is just if you bring a computer, if you bring an iPad, you're using <coughs> education technology? Yeah, you know that's something I've struggled with through my old, my, my, old, my all of my long career, and I don't know if we can really overcome that narrow conception of what technology means. You know, technology is Greek, and it means 
knowledge, ology of, of technique, of how to do things and how to understand things, praxis, as opposed to theory, application. And it goes far beyond just the idea of, of tools, you know, a screwdriver or a computer or whatever, as, as you've indicated. Uh, so I think the uh, easiest way to overcome the narrow definition of the phrase is by um, using a different phrase, you know. That's why I really like the uh, concept of instructional systems. It's much more holistic. And then educational technology becomes a subconcept within that broader uh, frame of reference. Part of my background when I was in the United States Marine Corps was in uh, training devices, and I worked on flight simulators. And, th and there I had to work on not only instructing the pilots, but also we had to do troubleshooting. I had to understand uh, digital circuitry as well as analog circuitry. And so I learned a lot about electronics there. And then I enjoyed, uh, after I went to graduate school, being able to uh, build on that background knowledge with the uh, early computer applications that we were using. Okay. So that was exciting. Another problem in uh, Iran or any other countries that the, um, they're using this field is that it is hard for us to introduce our field to them that what is it actually that actually we can do. So it gives people a narrow-minded uh, way of looking at our field. They don't know exactly what are, what, what are our capabilities and what are our things that we can actually do for them. How can we make yeah. our field more known to them? That's right. You know, historically our field was uh, born out of audiovisual support and, uh, and educational psychology, and so it was really focused on individuals and classrooms. But our true field, as it evolved, was the, was the broader concept of instructional systems design. And the military began to use it uh, extensively, and I had some early expenses experiences working on projects with the military from while well, I was at Syracuse and mm -hmm. so this uh, training manager came to Syracuse and I met with him and, and talked to him and he liked the broad perspective on the field that I had mm -hmm. and so I got involved with some projects with IBM and then that led with uh, that was AT&T sorry and then that eventually led to work with eight, eight IBM, Citibank and uh, other organizations and the reason I think we became so successful in these sectors was because we used a, a, a business approach, a business plan, you know, and we, we would talk to the companies about this instructional systems approach, not just that it's going to provide effective lesson plans, but it's a, it's a business process, not just an education process. So you, you can talk about the benefits of our field in terms of the return on investment instead of the traditional adult education approach, you know, where you it's very theoretical oriented. Ours is a very hard-nosed planning, engineering approach, you know, where you analyze the situation, determine what the deficits are, and then you design instruction that focuses on, on those deficits rather than just a general introduction to this or a general introduction to that. And we also focused on performance improvement mm -hmm. rather than just knowledge, you know, for the sake of knowledge. So whatever you teach, you have to show up a benefit and the performance on the job and then have measurable results you know that, that you can actually measure the consequences of what you're doing and it has to be efficient as well as effective so we use cost-benefit analysis to determine the return on investment and all of this under the umbrella of a systems perspective a holistic perspective so by by describing it to organizations in those terms and having a case example or two to show its benefits it takes it out of the realm of just school teachers, you know, and, and a narrow perspective. And that's much more appealing to uh, organizations. And it was very successful here and still is. The last question about our field is that where do you see the field of instructional design or educational technology or instructional systems to go in 10 years from now? Um, well, that's, that's a difficult question to answer, of course, uh, trying to look into the future. But I think the... Uh, the past is prologue to the future. You know, I think one of the things that really uh, helped move our field forward was the idea of integrated performance support systems so that the learning support was integrated into the workplace. So as people are working, like at, at uh, Citibank, and they're, tr they're talking to a customer about products or about problems with their account, and the uh, IBM employee can, if, if they don't quite remember something, if they haven't sold a particular product in a long time, they can push a button on their screen 
and on their computer they can read the benefits and the and the and the requirements and everything for that product and describe them to their customer on the phone as they're reviewing it themselves and so there there are many different uh, ways in which instructional support learning support performance support can be built into workstations and I see that over the I don't think that's gonna I don't think we've come close to reaching the full potential of that so I think that will continue to grow over the next 10 years with advances in technology you know the, the learning support will become just an integral part of a product now let's have a transition to the second uh, part of my interview with you which is about your great work arcs model um, after reading your work um, for some years and recently in the past two days I just focused on your arcs model a bit more through your papers and your writings the first question that came to my mind was about uh, this question that whether or not the arcs model is um, different is going to be different in different cultures can we use the same strategies you know, that you stated in different cultures or are these strategies um, for the four components that you have in your model attention relevance confidence and satisfaction um, are selected based on different models so it can be more generalizable yeah well the um, the way the arcs model evolved was through a, an extensive review of the literature on motivation and all the different theories uh, discovering that they could be uh, 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 s synthesized into the four pro into the four categories of ARCS and then within each category finding the general principles you know that that uh, pertained for example there were the idea of locus of control purpose of control there were like five different theorists who had different versions of a of, of theories that all had the same underlying elements so we synthesized those and the same thing in the other areas and so that provided a, a a theoretical foundation that was very stable you know and very well grounded in the literature and then the next step was to start applying that in actual learning settings and so that's where the some of the differences would occur as we would analyze the learning setting and and apply the ARCS to it you know we developed a list of strategies but uh, we, you know, but I incorporated a systems approach to that. So we would do a, a problem analysis in a given setting to determine where the big problems were. You know, if curiosity wasn't a problem, then we would just include some strategies to maintain curiosity. But if people didn't know, have any idea why they needed to learn something, then we needed a, a strong set of relevant strategies to improve that. So the overall concept of the model has been very stable in all settings you know all over the world uh, but the specific application of it depends upon the specific problem you're trying to solve and also uh, some cultural differences that occur the next question is somehow similar to this that um, I've heard from some people that arcs model is just for face-to-face -face, um, learning environments and it can't be uh, say applied to online learning environments where learners spend time in front of a computer without an, without an instructor and maybe with a, a standalone application. Um, can ARCS model be applied in those situations? Uh, absolutely. When uh, I taught an online course you know, before I retired and one of the things I realized very quickly is the learners don't really know each other. You know, so I, I created a, a, a first module of the first module that we worked within this online course was kind of a getting acquainted module getting acquainted with the course and getting acquainted with each other and so I gave the question students four four questions to respond to and they had to put something a response online to each question and that was the assignment so then after they did that then I uh, required them to read comments from a certain number of other students and, and then reply so they had to interact you know and and they loved it you know because they some people said you know I've been in a course with Ahmad this is the third time I've been in a course and I didn't even know him or where he was from but now we've gotten acquainted and uh, and so then they felt much more of a, a relationship with the fellow students more like you would do in a classroom although sometimes in a classroom you don't get to know each other either depends on the instructor but uh, that's one of the applications of ARCS another one was in the weekly assignments weekly tasks I would design things to uh, and use examples to try to 
uh, uh, you know, I had I had the students filled out, you know, uh, information about themselves as part of that first assignment. So I knew the backgrounds of the students and and their history, and so I could I could design tasks assignments that would be appealing to them based on their background knowledge that they came in with. Mm -hmm. So that's just a couple of examples of motivational design embedded with the learning design. Um, one question that I had was that can we um, say like can you point out a place where in uh, instructional design models right like Addy model we start doing the ARCS model design or in motivational design can we map ARCS on Addy or other instructional design models? Yes, uh, I find in many applications of, of instructional design, they, they start at the beginning of the Addy model and just work their way through it. And sometimes a lot there's a lot of givens that you wouldn't even have to do some steps in the Addy model if you just studied what's already exists in that learning environment. So I think the, the beginning point of applying instructional systems design should be in a, in a front end analysis, you know, where you uh, where you really do a thorough investigation of what the status quo is before you start imposing, you know, uh, you know, analysis and objectives and strategies and all of that. Well, motivation ties in with that. When, if you do a, a front end analysis, you may discover that, um, you know, specific motivational problems that need to be addressed early in the course if you want people to be engaged. You may find that the students already have a lot of motivation for the topic and they may also have quite a bit of background information so that you can begin your your application of your ADI model with uh, analyzing the learning task and creating instructional strategies and then more often though I think the the situations usually call for examining the status quo as I said discovering what the the uh, objectives are going to be for the for the given learning activity and then uh, what kind of instructional strategies will be appropriate and then you start thinking about motivation and how to integrate motivation you know to make things interesting so the introduction of the motivational uh, uh, design process can it can occur at the very beginning or it can occur during the process it depends on the status of the of the of the topic that you, the course or whatever that you're investigating uh, one question that comes to my mind right now is that some people think that these processes and these models are so rigid that you need to do this first then must do that second so I think it's more it's a little bit more fluid it's a little bit more flexible is that it I totally agree with you in fact that was that underlay what I was trying to say just then where uh, you, you do a meta analysis first to figure out what the givens are what the requirements are and then where you should start and uh, in order to get the as much immediate benefit to your client or your audience as possible and yeah I, I think and this comes with or it, it doesn't always come with experience but it does usually come with experience I mean when you're when you're teaching instructional design process to students who don't know anything about it you have to take them through in a step-by-step a -step process so they learn the process but then I think it's beneficial to teach them how to apply the process, you know, how to analyze the setting, how to do the kind of things we're talking about, to figure out what really needs to be done, what's most important, what you can use as givens that are already there, and that's something that doesn't always get taught in our courses, but that to me is really important. That begins to mark the difference between a novice and a journeyman, you know, on the way to becoming an expert. So another question. Uh about the ARCS model relates to the use of ARCS model for not instructional designer as an expert, but for a simple ordinary teacher. Can a teacher take your model and use it in his or her class? Absolutely. You know, absolutely. And I've got a lot of examples of that. Of course, they need some instruction on how to use it, but it doesn't have to be a, a full bore education on performance systems analysis and all that kind of thing. It can be more straightforward at the at the lesson planning and lesson implementation level a woman in the in the in the uh, in Syracuse a school teacher uh, developed some units on 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 Disney World and Disney characters and that kind of thing and and I was working with her as a consultant and then I showed her the principles of the arcs model and how to use it how to design and she very quickly caught on and said oh yeah that's just systematic planning and I said right 
in Japan, uh, my colleague over there, Katsuaki Suzuki, uh, was applying the ARCS model, and he was working as a consultant in a junior high school in Sendai, Japan, and he taught them to apply the ARCS model. And it's in a the, the whole the whole thing is in a single matrix, you know. On a I could I could give you an example of it, but how to uh, how to it, you know how to look at their class, how to determine what they um, get their attention, relevance, that sort of thing, and list all list ideas, list suggestions, and at the bottom select the ones that are most appropriate. And he taught them the process in a, just a few sessions, and they applied it. I've got examples of it. And it was very successful. The teachers themselves, working alone or in small groups, uh, applied it very successfully. There are so many examples of uh, the, the, that just adapting the model to the circumstances. You know, their teachers, they need to develop, they need to plan their lessons in as little time as possible. They have to be efficient because they're so overworked. So you just teach them the basic steps, have them work with their own materials, and then they're, they can apply it very easily. The next question is about um, something related to students, individuals, or the environment. Which one do you see more important with regard to motivation, the individuals or the environment? Oh, yeah. Well, neither. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I tend to use a, a holistic approach. Both individuals and environment are they're part of the process, you know. And they can both be strong or they can both be weak, or either one can be strong or weak. So I think that's part of the, the strength of a, of a holistic approach, a learning system, uh, an instructional systems design approach, which is kind of an engineering approach, where you look at the whole environment, the whole setting. You know, environment is part of the setting, the classroom characteristics, temperature, all that stuff. The characteristics of the individual is important, and the characteristics of the instruction, instructional strategies themselves. So I think... Um, uh, the, you know, it's just a matter of within that, uh, the front-end analysis is so important, and, and it doesn't have to be a, a highly formalized process, just getting to know the nature of the people you're working with, getting to know the, the, the characteristics of the setting, and then finding out through discussions what it is they're most concerned about, what the strength is, and then adapting your design process to addressing those and uh, working on those areas where the work is the most needed. Great. Because both are really important. Very good. So I can take away from this answer that we need to have a holistic, systemic view when we talk about motivational design. I, I absolutely agree to that and, and think it's important. A, a, lot, a lot of the, that's one of the, if I can in, inject a comment, I think that's one of the reasons the ARCS model has been so successful. Because when you read the motivational research, so much of it is very narrow and compartmentalized. McClellan's work on achievement motivation, uh, self-determination, DC's work on self-determination, and uh, these motivational researchers, they're, they're working in the traditional research frame of mind where each of them wants to have their concepts and theories that are narrowly defined, they do research on, and that's what they publish. And they don't go outside the boundaries of their own, uh, their own theories and, and strategies. And, and, the, and, of course, that's how they get strength as a reputation as a researcher, you know, by building something that no one else has done and having a lot of empirical research to support it. And that was where my work departed dramatically from, from the traditions in our, in our field of in educational psychology because I, uh, I wanted a synthesis, you know, that was pragmatic, that was useful, and that, because, you know, I would see so many commonalities you know, especially like in locus of control, uh, uh, um, origin pond theory, there are all these different concepts, but they all deal with the same thing. But each researcher had his own, you know, way of conceptualizing it, defining it, and doing research on it. But from a broader perspective, you know, you could say, well, that's basically the same thing as this, you know. And so that's why we worked on the synthesis, and that's why I think it's been so... Uh, stable and enduring over the years because it, it, it's, it's, it is holistic and integrative. With that, we'll get to the last question, which is a general question about graduate students, uh, and especially PhD students like me, who are um, just entering to the field and they want to know 
from someone who's been in this field for a long time, how can they be successful? Um, that, that's a good question. I uh, and you know I thought about that, and with my my background in liberal arts, as well as some in some degree science, uh, you know I have a perspective that's not the same as everybody's. I know, and over my years as as an active professor, some students would come in with a highly technical background, and that really affected their capacity for learning, and they're questioning why do I need to learn this. I think that uh, to be the most effective, not only student, but um, user of your knowledge after you've graduated, is to have a, a, a try to uh, get as broad a knowledge as you can, both within the boundaries of instructional design and instructional systems uh, activities surrounding it. I think define an area of specialization. So first of all, broad knowledge. You know, learn about every aspect of instructional design you can, and also of some of the uh, surrounding areas like measurement, uh, uh, hmm, sociology, you know, all these different areas. They all have useful things that you can adapt and incorporate into your practice of instructional systems design. And the second thing is specialization. You know, define an area of specialization, but do that within a broad context of interest. And then, as soon as you define an area of specialization, and I, would, I used to encourage my doctoral students to try to do that in their very first year. I don't know what I want to do my dissertation on. Yeah, of course not. But you know what you're interested in. You, know, you can define it, uh, whether you're more interested in, in technology applications and learning design or you know, theor learning theory, those kinds of things. And then every assignment you have, every time in a course you get an assignment, you can adapt to your area of interest regardless of the course. Do that because you'll be reading more about your interests and then you can adapt to that area later on. And then third is uh, learn about other topic inquiry. Learn about other topic areas. You know, each topic area, whether it's adult education, sociology, uh, uh, psychology, each has its own epistemology, its own technologies, the way it does research. You know, the way it studies its phenom the phenomenon in its field and then, um, uh, so different methods of inquiry. You know, there are many different methods of inquiry. In our field, you know, we tend to focus on traditional ed psych, educational psychology, learning psychology kinds of research methods. But there's quantitative research, which you know, some time ago they begin to incorporate more and more into our field. Um, the problem is some people get into quantitative research and they don't do the, I mean, qualitative research and they don't learn the quantitative methods. But I really think you need both in order to be a, a fully competent professional in our field and be more flexible. So, in other words, learn as much as you can within the boundaries of your field. Take courses for breadth as well as depth. Define an area of specialization and focus of your interest and do as many tasks on related to that as you can in your courses. And then finally, add breadth. Learn about the methods of inquiry and, and uh, methods of research and basic theories of related fields outside your own area of focus. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Keller, for your generosity of your time. And uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. And I, on behalf of people who asked me to come and do this interview, I really thank you for your time. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, too. I've enjoyed this, and uh, it stimulated me to go back and think about things that I haven't thought about in, in years, you know? And so it's, it's been very enjoyable, and I appreciate your approach. A very competent interview. Thank you so much. Thank you.